guys for having us again. We were here last year, and uh, I don't know, I, I see some familiar faces, so um, I can promise there will be there will be some fun demos in this, but we're, we're on a little more serious topic this year. You know, last year we talked a lot about mobile phones and the like, but this year the real topic on everybody's mind is the election and the machinery around the election. And one of the things that I've noticed as we, um, as we talk in cybersecurity about election security is that almost everybody is focused on either voting machines being hacked you saw the voting machine village at DEF CON, it's been all over the news, and everybody wants to talk about voting machines, or they want to talk about the candidates. You know, uh, John Podesta's email last time, and the DNC, and the Russians, and all of these stories that we're all hearing so much about over and over and over again, especially today with the indictments of the GRU agents, and um, the Chinese uh, attacks against hardware. There's so many things going on around this that, that seem to always focus on these topics, but what we realized and what we wanted to talk about is that there's a lot more to this process than just the candidates and the voting machines. And if my slides worked, it would work a lot better. Um, because when I think about the machinery of an election and the electoral process, it's not just the candidates and it's not just the committee and it's not just the volunteers who are out canvassing, but it's also the journalists and the activists and the donors and the election officials themselves in every county and the voting machine manufacturers, there's an entire electoral ecosystem, a democratic ecosystem, small d democratic, I'm not talking about the Democratic Party, that is involved in this process. And it has changed so much in the last 10 years. And now we are going to not subtly, because I'm not even gonna try to be subtle, switch up this remote. All right. So, in the last few years, we've seen technology change this ecosystem almost entirely. And it has been a radical shift. As recently as 10 years ago, this was the picture of the electoral volunteer and the canvasser that you see across the nation. Notice, notice the technology there, a clipboard and a, pe and a pen. And that was normal. And it's been normal for the entire, you know, the entire history of elections. This is how things were done. This person then goes back to campaign headquarters, takes everything that they've written down on paper, maybe just sticks it in a file, or they you know, sit behind the firewall and they enter it into some database behind, behind the scenes. And as recently as even the second term of the, the second Obama election, it was front page news in the Wall Street Journal that they had an app. Now, we have electoral campaigns with websites like this, where this, this is a site that the DNC has used to, um, to promote software for its campaigns. There are over 60 different pieces of software that I will run actually recommends that campaigns use. By the way, 60 different pieces of software all on one page makes a really good list of all the things that I would make phishing websites out of if I was an attacker. And you can't possibly think that having 60 different apps hasn't changed the entirety of the technological landscape. And a big part of this is because the entire ecosystem has gone mobile. No longer are we walking around with clipboards and pens. We're walking around with phones and iPads. And where are those connections happening? No longer am I walking back to the office and sitting at a computer behind the firewall. Now, I'm as likely to be working in Starbucks as anywhere else. And we see this trend across the entirety of the internet. This is a chart of all traffic on the internet. And you'll notice the cross on this line right here that happened in January 2017. The blue line on the top is traffic from desktops and laptops. The green line on the bottom is traffic from phones. For the first time last year, there's more traffic on the internet starting from a phone than there is from a computer. And because of that, it, that trend extends to the entire democratic ecosystem. I talk to reporters all the time, and I can't tell you how many reporters I've said, oh yeah, I just sit and I write my stories on my phone and I file everything from my phone. That didn't happen even five years ago. That is a new trend. And so it means that the Starbucks Wi-Fi is pretty much the network that your campaign runs on. 
Anybody think that the Starbucks Wi-Fi is the most secure place in the whole world? It's certainly not behind your firewall, right? We used to be able to build our networks such that we had a firewall and it was there to protect all the things from the bad people on the outside. Now, all of your users are connecting to those 60 different pieces of software from Starbucks and your firewall never even comes into the equation. Heck, even if they're sitting in campaign headquarters, all they have to do is turn off Wi-Fi and suddenly they're sitting in your building next to your firewall, but not on your network. And because of these changes, we've seen a radical shift in the way that the attackers are able to attack this ecosystem. And a big part of that is, and a big part of what we see has gone unnoticed. And, and for, to understand that, I have to give a bit of a history lesson. See, when computer threats originally came around, for those who are old enough in this room, some people would remember the I Love You virus, or SQL Slammer, or MS Blaster, or back when viruses had cool names, right? Do you remember that time? What did those things do? Nothing. They really just were written by some kid in their basement and they spread from one computer to another and they were annoying. They didn't steal credit card numbers. They didn't post your secret information on the internet. They didn't try and blackmail you. They just were kind of annoying. And so we had all these under-resourced attackers. Nobody was spending money. And then 10 years in, we saw the evolution of cyber criminals, people starting to steal credit card numbers, credit card breaches, things like that. And only about 2009, 2010, did we really see the espionage and the spies come into play. And everybody thinks that that's how this is gonna happen again. And see, we were lucky last time because with this evolution, we evolved our controls at the same time. In the late 90s, all you needed to do to secure your entire computer world was put McAfee antivirus or, or Norton antivirus on your, on your desktop, on your Windows 95 machine. And then, as the attackers got better, then you had a firewall, and then you had an intrusion detection system, and then you had a DLP process, and then you, you just layered it on. As the bad guys got better, the good guys got better. And everybody's expecting to see the same thing. Everybody, everybody I talked to was like, well, no, nobody's attacking mobile phones. I've never seen a SQL slammer for mobile phones. Right, you haven't. And guess what? You're never going to. And there's a reason for that. It's because on mobile phones, it went in exactly the opposite direction. On the first day that the iPhone was out, the very first day, intelligence services were trying to break into the iPhone. That was not the case when Windows 95 or Windows 3.1 came out. It was a totally different direction. And only a few years in did you start to see cyber criminals end up on these platforms. And we still have not gotten to the point where we see the, you know, the SQL slammers and the MS blasters and things like that. And we probably never will. Because frankly, we're, we're still in a spot where the majority of the attacks are by these really sophisticated attackers. And it really is such that the mobile device has become not just a target of nation states, but one of the primary targets of nation states. And the reason for that is pretty simple. Spies like phones. You, know, you think, why, would a, why do spies like phones more than computers? To me, the phone is the ultimate spy device. And if you don't believe that, just, I have a thought experiment. It's my favorite thought experiment. Imagine we go back, 50, 60 years, and we go hang out with a bunch of KGB agents in 1965. And I pick 1965 because to me, that's the golden age of, of like spying, right? It's John Le, Car Le Carre novels and Tom Clancy and things of that nature, right? And you've got all these Russian KGB agents and we'll crack open some vodka and we'll have uh, a couple of drinks and we'll hear about how they just spent $35 million to try and get one listening device into a building in Moscow, the, the US Embassy. And They'll regale us with those tales, and then we will regale them with a tale of our own. Here's the future we live in. In our time, every single person carries around a box this size. That box has a high fidelity camera, a high fidelity microphone, a GPS chip that can track you anywhere in the world within three meters. It contains every password you have. It contains every picture you've ever taken, every picture of your wife, your kids, your, your pets, your, you know, your grandma, it probably contains every memo you ever sent at work. 
It contains every note you've ever shared, every thought you have, it probably has your diary on it. And by the way, not only does everyone carry one, when the new version comes out, we all line up and spend another thousand dollars to buy, the, buy it on the first day. Imagine how you react if you're a KGB agent who just spent $35 million to get one listening device, and literally every single person in this room has one, and walked in with it, and just out of curiosity, how many of you turned off your phone before I started talking? Right. You get the point. This has changed the world of espionage. The world of espionage went from a thing that required huge amounts of effort to something that's almost trivially easy. And now, we're gonna make it even better. Now, not only does it have all that on it, now you can vote on that device as well. Now, your vote, at least if you're in West Virginia, is able to be cast through that mobile device. And lest you think, oh, Mike, nobody's gonna hack an election by hacking 17 million mobile phones. I completely agree with you. I think it's not that hard. We've often seen races like the one recently in Virginia. This one was settled by drawing lots because it was a tie. How many phones do I have to hack in Virginia to fix that election? One. Maybe two if I wanna really like, you know, make sure I have a good chance. And as this happens, we're all sitting around thinking, oh, it's just a phone. But the nation states have figured this out. The, the state actors already know and you see them attacking globally. This is a map of a state actor that we worked with EFF on to detect and catch attacking devices around the world. And this is where we found the targets. Now, most people, if I said, this is, this is cyber war, and this is an actor who's attacking around the world with this scale, and I said, who is it? They'd say, well, it's probably the Russians, the Chinese, or one of the, you know, one of the US, the, the Germans, etc. No. Lebanon. How many people think Lebanon and global cyber power in the same sentence? Almost nobody. But it's so easy now. And we see, this was sort of a spray and pray style attack. We see some really sophisticated targeting out there. This is my favorite one. We found one malware family that literally attacked all these people on one street. All of those people live on, are in exactly the same spot. I really do want to know what the other one is. Um, never, I never, we never managed to find that out. But you get the point. I don't have to attack globally when I can target all the people within one city block. Municipal elections, anyone? You get the point. And I think it changes the way we thought about the future. How many of you remember the movie uh, Enemy of the State? It's one of my all-time favorite surveillance movies. And we all thought that this was the future of surveillance. Will Smith's running through DC and spy satellites are tracking him through the thing and you know, drones are flying over. Billions of dollars just to track Will Smith running through, through Washington DC. What's the reality? I'd send Will Smith a couple of text messages. That's the real espionage use case. It's not spy satellites. It's not, um, it, it's not drones. It's text messages. And that's the nice thing about mobile espionage is it actually always looks the same. Mobile espionage use case is really predictable. It almost always starts with some sort of phishing attack. And I say phishing and everybody immediately thinks like I got an email from a Nigerian prince. That's not what I mean. Because on computers, on, on this device, the only way for me to fish you, the only way to get a message to you on this device is to send you an email. Mostly. You see Tim is making faces. Um, mostly. At least five, 10 years ago, 100%. Now, this device, I can get you messages through almost anything. Snapchat, SMS, Facebook, Twitter, WeChat, WhatsApp. Um, there's all kinds of ones that I'm not cool enough to know about because I don't have kids, but those of you with kids probably know all the cool ones that I'm not aware of. But the point is, I can get you a message. And I get you a message and you do something. You click on a link. Or I just say, hey, you should install this app. And you do, because people are surprisingly easily taken in by these things. 
You install the app, then that app exploits the phone, escalates privileges, you know, takes over the phone effectively, and then I steal stuff, right? I steal your vote, I steal your information, I steal your access, I can steal whatever. And so this is what it always looks like, and it's so effective. What we've found in our research is that individuals are 56% more likely, with the same message, to click on it on a phone than they are on a computer. Now, that seems kind of crazy if you think about it, but it actually makes a lot of sense. We've been training people not to click on messages and not to open attachments in their email for 20 years. And we've trained them all a whole lot of different tactics on how to do that. If I find two different websites from Google, I have two links, they look the same. One of the very first things you're taught in, in security awareness training, and I'm sure you've all taken this, what is it? Hover over the links with your mouse. How do you do that on here? You don't. It doesn't work. And so telling the difference, the other thing that we teach people is make sure it looks the way the site usually looks. Has anybody used a phone? Does the site ever look the same on a phone as a computer? No, of course not. So it already doesn't look like it's supposed to, and you can't do the thing that you're most used to. And so telling the difference between the real one and the fake one starts to get hard. The other thing we teach people is read the URL bar which works really well when the URL bar is this long on your computer and not as well when it's this long on your phone. And you can see both of those say Microsoft in there. Can you really tell which one the real one is? Because the useful stuff's all cut off past the three dots. And so telling the difference between a real site on your phone and a fake site on your phone is a lot harder than a real site on your computer and a fake site on your computer. It, and it makes for the perfect storm for attackers. And so you see these attackers really going for it this way. And we're about to make it so much worse. This is literally a story that came out yesterday that we had to include because it was so powerful. The idea that literally every campaign is now starting to send messages to the constituents. And by the way, all those messages start with something like, hi, so-and-so, I'm with Doug Jones for Senate. Click on this link. How do you know that's really from the campaign or that's from Eva pretending to be the campaign wanting to steal your information? You don't, right? And so we're gonna train all these users that they're used to getting these things and going to links that the campaign tells them to. Sounds like the perfect storm for bad guys if you ask me. And this horse has already left the barn. This is where we're going, right? This is happening today. And we're basically setting it up so that the users are easily susceptible to the kind of attacks we see in the real world. And it really does always look like that. And we see it move so fast. Recently, we caught a phishing attempt against the DNC. It turned out that it was an exercise that the DNC didn't know about, but it looked so much like a real attack that we actually have to use it because it's a really great example. Everybody thinks that phishing sites would stay up for a long time. They don't. If you're a really serious attacker, these things go up and down incredibly quickly. Our head of phishing research is in the front row, Jeremy. He can, if you guys wanna find out all about phishing, talk to him afterwards. But basically, he, he sent me a note um, about 6.20 one Monday evening and said, I have a site, there's nothing on it. By 7.30, it looked like this. By 8.30, it looked like that. And by the way, that's the real site next to it. Two hours. Now what we would have expected right after that, had this been a real exercise and not a drill, was as soon as it looks like that, emails, text messages, Facebook messages start going out. And you might think, oh, well they're gonna be, you know, it's gonna be like, hi, I'm a Nigerian prince, please go enter your password. No, the kinds of things we see real nation states do are incredibly sophisticated. They know their targets. They know how to attack their targets. These are my two favorite examples. These are examples of the use of a piece of um, uh, state-level spyware against two different targets. One was a dissident in the Middle East. The other was a researcher in Mexico. But you get an idea of the sophistication of these attacks, especially from the one in Mexico. They knew that the 
researcher's name was Mr. Simon. They knew his daughter's name. They knew where he lived. And they sent him a text message that said, Mr. Simon, your daughter, daughter's name, was just in a, in a terrible accident. She's in the hospital. This is the hospital. Click here to, to get the directions to where she is. Anybody who has a daughter not click on that message? No way. We all do. Every single one of us. Heck, if that had my cat's name, I would have clicked on it. And I'm supposed to be good at this, right? But that's exactly what would happen. And you think, everybody's watched movies and seen hacking on the movies. Everybody thinks hacking's so sophisticated. Hacking is not sophisticated. This is what would have happened if you had actually clicked on that link. You get a text message with a link like that. The link opens, you click, it, you click on the link, the browser opens, browser closes, it's the last you ever see. Uh, if you click on the link again, you get redirected, in Mr. Simon's case, to an actual hospital website. He would have found out that his daughter wasn't there, but too late. His phone's already infected and able to track him, record him, steal all of his information, and basically compromise his entire life. And it's that simple. It doesn't look flashy like you see it on the movies. It looks foreign and uneventful. And I bet at least a few people in the room have opened a link and had their browser crash at least once this week. I know I have. Uh, I'm pretty sure I don't have this on my phone, but uh, it's because I do this for a living. But you have to understand that this is the way that the world is going. And things are rapidly changing. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to my wonderful co-presenter. Are we good? If I get to change the slides. Now we're good. Thank you for coming out here today. Uh, so my part of the presentation is largely focused on answering the question, who gets targeted by this kind of state malware? And uh, the, generally, the first person that I think of when I think of targets of, of state malware are journalists. Uh, how many of you here in this room are journalists? We have a few, one or two or three or seven or ten. Um, so we have a number of journalists in the room. How many of you here have had some sort of digital security training? One or two or well, most of you. Most of you have had some kind of digital security training. That's cool. Um, so uh, journalists are extremely tempting targets for state actors. And one of the reasons for that is because journalists have sources. They have all kinds of interesting information. A journalist who is good at their job pisses off people in power. And the people in power have malware. And when the people have, in power have malware, they will use it in order to try to unmask the journalist's sources, figure out what they know, figure out what they're about to publish, figure out where they're going. Uh, Probably one of the best examples of this is, uh, I think starting in tw uh, 2011, uh, we saw the uh, New York Times get hacked. And we'll talk about that uh, a little bit later. Um, and of course, journalists also um, are really excellent targets for phishing. Um, so in these classes that you had, your digital security classes. Uh, how many of you were told, don't click on strange links or open strange attachments? That would be everybody. Um, so uh, for those of you who are not journalists, do you know what journalists do for a living? Click on strange links and open strange attachments. This is literally their, like 90% of their job. If you walk into a digital security training and you tell journalists, um, that this is how they should protect themselves, all that you have done is given them the world's most useless advice. Uh, you have just patted yourself on the back on, ah, I am so very smart, I have taught these journalists a thing or two, and then you fly away and every single one of your journalists is going to get owned. So that's a bit of a problem. Um, some examples of the, of the kind of journalists that have, uh, that have been targeted uh, include uh, this is Melissa Chan over here on, the, uh, on my right. Uh, Melissa was working at Al Jazeera. I believe she currently works at the New York Times. Uh, I pulled down her staff page. Um, and Melissa was based in Beijing at a time, I think probably in about 2011, when she was, uh, received an email, a phishing email, 
uh, with an attachment promising a juicy story, and it turned out to be the Chinese government sending her malware. Uh, this was probably one of the very first uh, instances of uh, government targeting a journalist that I was aware of very early in my sort of nation state malware work. Um, next to her is, uh, is it in the uh, Petrusheva? Uh, Irina Petrusheva is the editor-in-chief of a, um, the only independent newspaper in all of Kazakhstan. Uh, needless to say, she is not actually based in Kazakhstan anymore. Irina lives in Russia. Uh, and uh, she too was uh, targeted by malware. Uh, EFF knows about this because it was part of a campaign uh, that we spent some time tracking, and also because Irina uh, was uh, one of EFF's clients, and we take it really, really personally uh, when uh, governments try to own our clients. Uh, so Irina was also sent uh, an email with an attachment, which was made to look like a legal document, uh, Irina and uh, her newspaper, Respublika, were involved in an uh, ongoing lawsuit with the government of Kazakhstan, which uh, was uh, trying to figure out who their sources were for a series of articles that they wrote about uh, an anonymous leaks website uh, called KazaLeaks, which showed all kinds of corruption in Kazakhstan's government. So uh, most of you are familiar with the, with the hack of the, of the New York Times. So it's not just individual uh, journalists who get, uh, who get targeted. So it's not just freelancers. It's not just Melissa. It's not just Irina. Uh, the entire organization can get targeted. Uh, the first big report on this was Mandiant's APT1 report uh, talking about the way in which the Chinese government was targeting the New York Times as an organization. And what was particularly interesting about this report was you could see uh, the Chinese uh, government keeping regular working hours. You could see uh, the hackers show up, come to work, 8.30, 9 o'clock, start sending out emails. Uh, and you can see them continuing to do that for the next eight or nine hours and then go home and go to sleep and come back and do it again. These are incredibly persistent attacks. So even if you get one email and you're like, ha, that's a Nigerian prince, or hey, that's clearly a scam, uh, do you think that you're going to be able to avoid uh, falling for every single request for you to click on a link or open an attachment? And let me tell you, the answer is no. Who else gets targeted? Dissidents. So uh, this is Ahmed Mansour, uh, also known as the million dollar dissident for reasons I'm about to describe to you. Uh, Ahmed Mansour is a pro-democracy activist uh, based out of the uh, UAE, where democracy is not particularly popular. Uh, the government has spent a lot of time beating him up and uh, he is currently in jail. But in the years leading up to uh, his jailing, um, Ahmed Mansour's phone was kind of a nation state malware honeypot. Uh, if you wanted to know what malware the UAE was using at any given time, just check out Ahmed's iPhone. It was likely to be on there. And uh, this is where Lookout and Citizen Lab found a sample of, uh, of the Pegasus malware. And Pegasus was unusual in that it uh, strung together not one, not two, but three different zero-day exploits. In order, to, uh, in order to function on his iPhone. So dissidents piss off governments. Governments have nation state malware. They use it to spy on people. So you would think, you know, kind of pro-democracy activists, definitely the kind of people who would be of interest uh, to governments, um, but they are, are not the only people, uh, the only other people who get targeted. Uh, another another uh, kind of activist that gets targeted is, uh, also an EFF client, I'm kind of biased in favor of EFF clients for very obvious reasons, um, our client, uh, Mr. Gedlu Kidane. Uh, Gedlu Kidane is not his real name. He uh, is a, a gentleman who emigrated from Ethiopia in the 1970s and moved here to Silver Springs, Maryland. Started a family, he's a soccer dad, and works in IT. So Gedlu Kidane uh, opened up an attachment because he was doing some tech support for diaspora groups uh, who were opposed to, uh, to the government in Ethiopia. 
and as a result ended up with an infected uh, machine in his home. Uh, we were able to show that his, uh, that his computer was infected by the Ethiopian government with uh, software called FinSpy, which is made by a European company called FinFisher. And we were able to show conclusively that this software spied on his uh, Skype calls, it, sc it, spied, uh, it spied on his Google searches, and it even spied on his son uh, working on his school report. So very, very private and personal stuff. Uh, EFF sued the government of Ethiopia on his behalf in the United States. And our argument is, uh, and continues to be, uh, if you are Mr. Kidane and you live in the United States and your computer is in the United States and you have not left the United States, you have the full privacy rights that the, afforded to you by the laws of the United States. And under those laws, it is a violation of the wiretapping statute uh, to install malware on somebody's computer and spy on their Google searches and Skype calls. Uh, the judge did not agree with us and eventually dismissed our case, which was extremely disappointing. And we're hoping for sort of a, another shot at this a little bit further down the line. And finally, uh, another group of people who get targeted, lawyers. Uh, again, I take this very personally because I have an entire floor of vicious attack lawyers at the Electronic Frontier Foundation uh, who do nothing but impact litigation. And as a result of this work, uh, I, I see a lot of people who are involved in this kind of work get targeted. Uh, for example, the reason why we heard about this uh, Kazakhstan case was that one of our clients received a message, uh, a phishing message, but the client wasn't the only one that was targeted. The um, other clients were targeted, lawyers, the, the client's lawyers were targeted, we were targeted, um, we also saw um, press people targeted, anybody who might be a sort of hub of information, who's going to be talking to a whole lot of people who has access to privileged information is likely to be a target of this kind of attack. And finally, uh, sort of the, the, the most surprising group of people that, uh, that I've seen attacked recently are scientists. So Mike talked a little bit earlier um, about, uh, about this guy who received a text message about his daughter being in the hospital. Uh, this was a, uh, an academic and or scientist uh, located in Mexico, and he was working on research having to do with the connection between uh, sugar and uh, poor health outcomes and obesity. Uh, this was particularly interesting to certain uh, parts of the Mexican government because at the time uh, the government was debating a soda tax or a sugar tax. Uh, as a result of which, uh, these guys ended up getting, uh, getting fished by government actors. So you think you're an academic, you're a scientist, you're a lawyer, you're a journalist who doesn't work on, on government stories. You don't think that you're going to uh, get this kind of attack, and that's absolutely incorrect. Um, and even scarier, just in case I have not already scared your pants off, uh, prepare yourself for the post-pants world. Um, now that we are about to extend this all to uh, e-voting on people's mobile devices, potentially what we have is a situation in which every single person's phone is worth hacking by a state actor. And with that to conclude, let's talk about what we do. And if you talk to anybody in the security industry, um, you know, if this is your candidate or some campaign staffer in the back of a car on the way to some event, you're going to hear put two-factor authentication on their phone. You know. Google Authenticator, Authy, Duo, RSA, you name it. Um, just out of curiosity, how many of you have two factor to some two-factor app on your phone? Most of you, right? And we're taught that this is the gold standard of security, and it is. It absolutely is. And I'm a big fan of two-factor authentication. Do not get me wrong. I'm not going to say anything negative about it because it's really important. But the thing you have to understand is there are no panaceas in this world. And that there's an old rule in security that says when someone else has access to your computer, it's not your computer anymore. And the same thing happens to be the phone. 
This happens to be that guy's phone. You notice I can pop open my two-factor authentication token and it just happens to be there. But, and by the way, there's no magic trick to this. This is live. I'll show it to you not plugged in later if you want. I just have to plug it in so it's on the screen. Um, this person happens to be me. Um, I get a text message from my IT folks that say, hey Mike, if you want to keep accessing things, you better install our new app. What did I just do? Oh, I turned the phone sideways, sorry. Um, <laughs> And I, I'm like, well, I certainly still need access to all of my resources. I better click on the message. And I get sent to this web page, which is normal. It looks like any other web page I'd log into, Dropbox or whatever. And I enter my name. I'm not going to enter my real password, uh, but I will enter the word password because that's a very secure password in case you haven't heard. Um, and you'll notice it does exactly what it says. I log in. I um, you know, install the app, and I go, I look, look, I'm installing the app, everything's good. Then I click, and I'm like, oh, okay, so now I have to log in. Great, this is fantastic, this is exactly what we want. So then I have to get my two-factor token out again. Well, I'm secure, right? I have two-factor authentication. Well, this is the hacker's phone. Um, I'm going to be the hacker from over here. Just give me a second. You notice, this two-factor authentication doesn't work. Everybody can see that, even the folks in the back? There's nothing on there. Right? I'm gonna quickly run a couple of commands. Give me a half second. And now, um, I'm gonna pick on you guys. Read the number. Uh, 407-118. You wanna wait till it changes, just so I can prove that I just stole the two-factor token off that phone? We'll give it a second. I now have, you notice, I stole the username and password when I logged in. I now have the username and password and the two-factor authentication token forever. I can now log in as, as me with this phone. Here. 803160. Let it verify if that's still what's on screen. And so you get the idea. And once the phone's broken into, anything is fair game. You know, we talked, we've been, Kind of harping on the mobile voting use case but your facebook passwords your all the passwords that you have your email you name it it's all fair game and if i can steal the two-factor token i can steal anything and that's what we have to remember we have to remember that it's not just about the software we put on there it's also about the actual protection of the device the device is insecure all the other stuff on there is insecure too So if you're going to take away one thing, one lesson from this particular talk, uh, the thing that I would like you to remember is that there are no small fish. Uh, I very often hear from people that I'm training, if I have nothing to hide, I have nothing to fear, uh, or I'm just not worried about the government, or I'm not important, or I'm not high profile. Um, but one of the things that I think it's very important to take away from this is that everybody has something to hide. Everybody has something to fear. And even if they don't, um, sometimes it is connected to their work. Sometimes it has to do with the people that they talk to. Sometimes it has to do with the, with the places that they go. And as we continue to uh, broaden uh, the sheer number of things that we do on our mobile devices and uh, that we sort of move into our digital lives, uh, the more likely it is that, uh, that we are going to be targeted by this, uh, this kind of malware. I wanted to leave you with one last example. And uh, this is a, a little story about a colleague of mine um, who worked at EFF for, I think, about a year, year and a half. And she had just, she had just come to work for EFF. Her name is uh, April Glazer. She's a journalist now, fantastic journalist. Um, but at the time, I was working on EFF's international team, and I had spent a whole lot of time uh, writing blog posts about the um, Vietnamese government's crackdown on bloggers. So they were sending a lot of bloggers to jail. They didn't like the things that they were saying. One of these bloggers was a guy named Le Quoc Quan. Uh, I did not have time to finish a blog post um, about Le Quoc Quan, and so I asked my colleague, April, 
if, uh, if she would please write this for me. I sent her all of the necessary links. She put together a story. The story is here. Uh, and as a result of this one bit of activism that my coworker once did regarding a Vietnamese blogger, she was targeted by the Vietnamese government uh, with malware sent in a phishing attack. So uh, activism, not even once, folks, not even once. No small fish. Now, any questions? Yeah, go for it. Actually, here, let me hand you the mic. Yeah, I have a raw fever. But um, there is, uh, there seems to be a belief that iOS is far more resistant to malware than Android, and you, your presentation didn't seem to uh, suggest that. What, what are your thoughts about that? <laughs> This is literally my favorite question. I get it all the time. So, so here, here's the thing. Um, remember the triangles that I had at the beginning? So in terms of low-level stuff, I agree with the statement. Um, and there's a lot of demographic reasons why. If you just think about where most of the criminal malware and the low-level malware comes from, it often comes from China and, the, and that part of the world, which is, until the last three, four years, was almost entirely negative. But when you talk about the kind of things we're talking about, state level actors who are especially working more in the Western world, platform doesn't matter. I'm as likely to hack into a Google Pixel or a Samsung device as I am into a modern iPhone. Because when you're talking about state actors who have millions of dollars to spend on developing these kind of tools or, or to buy Pegasus, I mean, the, the rumors have it that, that the Mexicans spend upwards of $25 million a year on that software. When you're spending $25 million a year, you can afford to do iOS and Android at the same time. And so uh, in, the, in the general case um, and, and the sort of reputation case, that, that may have been true, but in the actual kind of things we're talking about, there's no difference. And will Apple update deal with things like that? Well, I, I mean, everybody's updates deals with these. I mean, Google's been working really hard to make sure that their phones all get updated as well. Every, you know, good security hygiene is always a good thing. Always patch your stuff, always update your apps, always keep you know your security settings on. That's good advice no matter what platform you're on. But fundamentally, fundamentally everybody's working hard at this, but the state level actors, they don't care whether you're on an iPhone. Actually, uh, to give you an example, the NSO group also advertises a version of Pegasus for BlackBerry. They don't care if you're on BlackBerry. Right? If you're talking at that level of attacker who can spend millions of dollars at a time, they will go to whatever platform the target is on and they'll have an exploit for that. Other question? Ooh. Given we're in DC and it being uh, the spy capital of the world, uh, anything sort of with respect to stingrays and anything that's being done to sort of combat that? My team actually has a, a pet project in which we are currently trying to uh, build an MZ catcher or Stingray uh, catcher. So uh, we are fairly certain that most police departments and sort of local law enforcement uh, have moved away from Stingrays uh, towards uh, the sort of newer stuff like Hailstorms and that uh, Hailstorm has uh, LTE um, LTE capabilities. So right now what we're trying to do is we're trying to build uh, something that will detect hailstorms. And once we detect those, um, our goal is to try to catch um, police departments or local law enforcement using them against sort of like large public crowds of people um, on the theory that if you are using these against large public crowds of people, that uh, you're spying on large numbers of people. You cannot spy on a single individual uh, with an MZ catcher. And because of that, you're violating everybody else's Fourth Amendment right. Uh, so uh, we're working on it, but first there has to be a very large hardware project. I have one other piece to bring to that. So if you think about the way that attackers work, right? Um, Proximity-based attacks are always used in, in a different way than some of the attacks we're talking about. If I'm going to use a Stingray or a, a Hailstorm or any of those sorts of devices, I have to be physically proximate to that person. I also have to have some amount of immunity from prosecution. You know, I, I, if I just pop up a Stingray right here, that's an FCC violation and I'm going to jail. 
So you see it from law enforcement. The reason you see it more in D.C. is because embassies are sovereign ground, right? I mean, I can, I mean, if I'm the Russians, I can stick up as many fancy devices in their embassy as they want. They can do what they want. Um, you're not going to find that as often in Kansas or, you know, pick place here. And so a lot of the kinds of um, more targeted attacks we see, the other, the other reason for it is I can sit in Kazakhstan and send Eva a text message. If I want to do something like, like a stingray, I have to be within, what is it, 400 yards or something? It, that opens me up to a lot more you know, counter intel, a lot more other sorts of, um, of countermeasures against me. So if I'm a, I mean, I, I think no matter who the attacker is, the, they're in business too in some ways. I'm not gonna spend a million dollars if I can send five text messages, right? So, um, you know, you see, you see those situ in, in certain situations that make sense for proximity, but I think the larger, the larger pattern is more the remote attacks because they're easier to execute and they're easier to get away with. One of the things that EFF is particularly concerned about uh, is mass surveillance. Um, sort of often mass surveillance and targeted surveillance are presented in opposition to one another. If you tell people that mass surveillance is absolutely a human rights violation and absolutely um, a violation of our constitutional rights, then what's left is targeted surveillance. That is the tool that we are leaving uh, sort of governments and law enforcement to use. Uh, against its citizens, and that's fine as long as it is all done with a warrant and with probable cause and with the you know, sign off of a judge and all of these other things. Uh, what governments and law enforcement really want is the freedom to do this sort of surveillance with an absolute minimum of oversight, which is something that EFF finds extremely alarming. Uh, and if, even if you trust the government or the law enforcement in the, uh, in the United States, if you are a person who walks the, the streets of, of American cities and goes, I'm perfectly fine, the cops are my friends, uh, you may not feel that way about other governments who also have access to this technology. Um, even if you trust the US government, do you trust the Chinese government? Do you trust the Russian government? Do you trust the Ethiopian government or the Vietnamese government? Uh, and I, I should hope that at least for some of the people in this, in this room, there is at least one government that you are concerned about that you don't think should have this kind of power. All right, thank you all for coming. We really appreciate it. Come, come find us afterwards. We love to talk about this stuff and uh, thanks again.